Welcome to our July uh, Grand Rounds, which we've uh, shifted around uh, to accommodate the uh, Japanese Orthopedic Association Traveling Fellows. Uh, very grateful that they are all here. I'm going to have Dr. Faruza Badi uh, speak in a moment uh, about the nice relationship uh, we've had with the uh, JOA. Um, we have uh, one kudos this morning. Is, is Zach here? No? Yeah. Zach, uh, kudos uh, to you. Uh, this is from Emily Bartlett, who I think is a uh, chief resident, uh, perhaps in, in general surgery. Um, and uh, she went on to say that uh, Zach uh, did a great job keeping up with a number of consults and did so with a fantastic attitude. He also made a point of running the list with the trauma team and independently also ran the list with the charge nurse as well. His exemplary communication and collaboration with the trauma team at all levels was instrumental in keeping everything moving uh, on a very busy night. So thank you, Zach. So with that, I'll have Dr. Faruz Abadi uh, introduce the uh, traveling fellows. Thanks, Howard. So uh, we're fortunate to have the Japanese Orthopedic Association Traveling Fellowship in collaboration with the AOA American uh, Orthopedic Association Fellowship. Uh, just a little bit about the fellowship. It's a collaboration between the two organizations that started back in uh, 1992. And really the purpose of it is it's meant to foster clinical, uh, academic, as well as a cultural uh, exchange. The fellowship is about three weeks uh, long, and it alternates between uh, U.S. surgeons going to Japan and Japanese surgeons coming uh, to the U.S. And University of Washington has really been a hosting center uh, for now quite a while, and we try to host the Japanese fellows whenever uh, they visit. And um, on their tour here today, they're going to be here till Friday. They're going to focus their attention at Harborview today and then University of Washington uh, tomorrow. I'd like to say this takes a lot of organization and the lion's share of work was done by uh, Victoria Cannon. She was very creative and has done a lot of work to set this up and thank you, Victoria. We, we all appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, Albert and Connor who've also really uh, helped a lot. So we have a tradition of sending uh, surgeons from our institution to Japan through this uh, uh, collaboration going back to sorry to date you a little bit Bruce going back to 1994 uh, uh, Dr. St. Jorzen then Dr. Nork then myself and Dr. Clavino and we hope to continue this so for any of the faculty members that are interested I think this is a great uh, traveling fellowship to do and uh, you can talk to any of the four of us and uh, we'll try to give you some insight uh, into that now to start off with I like to introduce the fellows there's going to be six of them there's going to be uh, six different uh, talks. Um, Dr. Uh, Hattis is, Hatta is going to talk to us about shoulder biomechanics for uh, treatment of uh, rotator cuff uh, uh, tears. Then we have uh, Dr. Eno, who's a, a spine surgeon. He's going to talk to us about application of allograft bone for spinal surgery, differences between the U.S. Uh, and uh, Japan. Then uh, Dr. Kato uh, from Osaka is going to talk to us about intervertebral disc regeneration for, with small compounds and cell-based uh, therapy. Then uh, Dr. Matsumoto is going to talk to us about kinematically in line total knee arthroplasty and the experience in Japan. And uh, then uh, Dr. Miwa is going to talk about risk factors for post-operative deep infection in uh, bone tumors. And Dr. Uh, Nakashima is going to talk to us about lateral axis surgery and uh, spine. And we're going to end that with the discussion uh, section. So if you can hold your questions uh, to the end, that'd be great. And then we'll have a discussion at the end, yeah, especially if we go over a couple minutes. Okay, great. And can you pull up the first slide? Yeah.
Yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. It's a great honor to give talk at the University of Washington as the JOA uh, AOA Traveling Fellowship. Uh, I first I have, uh, have to apologize. I changed the topic because of the time of the presentation. Uh, and uh, some of the movie is not working because I use uh, Windows and uh, I have to do presentation in Macintosh. So the title of my presentation is Biological Enhancement of Spinal Fusion. Indication of spinal fusion includes <laughs> spinal instability, osteoporotic vertebral fracture, and also spinal deformity. Advancement in spinal instrumentation has significantly improved the fusion rate. However, we cannot attain 100% fusion rate because the induction of a heterotopic bone formation process requires a complex balance of biological factors and operative technique to achieve successful fusion. The failure of fusion results in the adverse effects on health-related QOL and also the cost. Uh, this case is the uh, adolescent idiopathic scholars patient. In this case, uh, achievement of successful fusion is not so difficult because the face spine includes osteoporosis, intervertebral disc degeneration, sarcopenia, and also decline in neural function. So spine surgeon are uh, expected to explore treatment strat strategy for handling these adverse conditions. This slide summarizes the uh, characteristic of commercially available biological bone substitute. Among these, of course, BMP has the most potent osteoinduction ability. However, BMP2 uh, reported to correlate with some of the complications, including soft tissue swelling, seroma formation, osteolitis, radiculitis. Also, not, not all of these are directly related to the use of BMP2, but some of these are related to the, the use of BMP. So, our department has been exploring the way to improve the BMP-based bone tissue engineering by maximizing the bone induction ability and also minimizing the inflammatory uh, inflammation-related side effects. <clears throat> we have been approached for this uh, topic by the following uh, four approach. The first is improvement of drug delivery system and a combination with another anabolic agents and a quest for the more potent BMP. And the most rec recent one is intravital imaging of BMP induced bone formation. The, the from one to three has already published, so I just do the quick introduction and I will talk a little more detail about the intravital imaging of BMP uh, induced bone formation. First one is the published in 2005, it's a little bit old. So to uh, reduce the required dose for the BMP, I combined the two drug delivery system. The one is the polymer, biodegradable polymer, and the one is the hydroxyapatite. So by coating the surface of hydroxyapatite, the biodegradable polymer, and uh, we could attain the sustained release of BMP. And the second one is we combined the teriparatide for the BMP. You can see by uh, combining teriparatide with the low dose BMP, you can significantly increase the fusion rate. If you combine high dose BMP and the teriparatide, you can significantly improve the uh, quality of the newly formed bone. And the, another approach is the uh, quest for the potent BMP. The, uh, and we investigated the effect of the BMP heterodimer as you know, BMP2 and the BMP7 are homodimer. And uh, I use a small amount of BMP, which cannot attain 100% by using the BMP7 and the BMP2 homodimer. You can see even uh, six weeks uh, post operative uh, after the implantation, the successful fusion cannot attain with this low dose BMP. But if you use BMP heterodimer, uh, with a very small dose, you can attain 100% fusion rate. Uh, this slide uh, shows the inflammatory reaction by using the uh, very high resolution M MRI, uh, which is 11.7 uh, Tesla. So you can see the, the higher bone induction ability of a BMP27 heterodimer do not accompany the inflammatory reaction. This uh, mechanism is uh, suggest, uh, is reported to be because of the BMP2 homodimer, uh, sorry, BMP receptor uh, exists uh, type 1 and type 2, 
So BMP two homodimer have higher affinity to type only type one receptor, and the BMP seven uh, homodimer has higher affinity to only type two receptor. But BMP two seven heterodimer has higher affinity to both uh, BMP type one and type two receptor. This is a suggested the mechanism of the, this higher bone induction ability of BMP two and seven heterodimer. And the, the first, uh, last topic is the intervital imaging of BMP in this bone formation. So until now, there's a lot of paper has already published about the improvement of drug delivery system for BMP and a combination with another cytokine. However, the, the process, how it works, is not clear. So during the uh, past two decades, intravital imaging has launched a, a new era in the field of biological imaging. Uh, this is a two-photon excitation microscopy. Uh, it's a fluorescent imaging technique that allow imaging of living tissue up to about one millimeter. We used this technique and created the double transgenic mass, which can visualize the osteoblast in green and osteoblast in red, and implanted the collagen sponge containing the BMP2 and uh, visualize the succeeded in visualizing uh, BMP-induced ectopic bone formation process. You can see this green one is osteoblast, and the blue one is collagen fiber created by the osteoblast, and the red one is a blood vessel. This is a time-dependent cause. Uh, uh, for, unfortunately, this slide uh, is not moving, but on day seven, af day seven after implantation, you don't see the, any osteoblast. But on day seven or day 10, you can see the green osteoblast appears. The after the collagen fiber formation improves. <laughs> this slide just visualizes the collagen fiber by the technique called the second harmonic generation. You can see uh, uh, the collagen fiber formation uh, became mature uh, with the time uh, proceeds. And uh, this slide also does not move, but uh, if you uh, administer PTH 134, you can see the osteoblast appears much faster than the control group. So the PTH administration can accelerate the migration of osteoblast. And uh, by using this technique, you can quantify the velocity of osteoblast movement, and also we can quantify the morphological change in the osteoblast. And also by using this tracking technique, we can uh, quantify the time-dependent change in the number of osteoblasts and osteoblasts. So in conclusion, biological enhancement of spinal fusion will hold an important role in future spinal surgery where aging spine comes to the medical attention. Further research and the clinical data collection are expected to provide evidence for the optimal use of BMP or other osteoinductive factors. Thank you for your attention. So uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here and uh, uh, make a presentation uh, today. So uh, I'm uh, Tomoiki uh, Matsumoto from Kobe, Japan. So the title of the uh, today's uh, study, a topic is the Modified Kinematical and TKA uh, Japanese Experience. <coughs> Uh, so as you know, uh, <coughs> so uh, constitutional bias has uh, received attention uh, to now uh, uh, to be the uh, one of the solution uh, for the dissatisfaction after TKA. And in addition, single axis uh, of the knee joint is reported to be uh, closer uh, to flexion ex flexion extension axis uh, of the knee joint uh, compared with. Uh, surgical epicondral axis. So based 
On this uh, background, kinematical around TKA has uh, received much attention to now uh, to <coughs> the uh, so new uh, target of the alignment. So targeting for natural alignment, uh, femoral component is placed targeting to a single axis and tibial component is placed as various tibial joint line. So already uh, meta-analysis uh, assessing nine studies uh, showed the better knee society score in kinematic alignment TKA compared with mechanical alignment TKA. So, but uh, uh, we have to check uh, the reliability and the safety of this technique uh, before the use of this uh, new technique. So we uh, firstly uh, perform the uh, radiological analysis of uh, using the uh, long leg sending radiograph of the lower limbs. And in 797, uh, asymptomatic adult volunteers and 454 also are sick patients uh, by the uh, cross-sectional study. In this study, I we find and we confirm the constitutional virus in even in Japanese population, and the tibial joint line uh, was uh, about three uh, degrees medially inclined uh, in average, and which is the uh, switched to ten degrees uh, with the away express uh, progression. So the point here is that uh, we cannot figure out the uh, pro proximity uh, tibial deformity uh, when we have to do the uh, TK surgery. And next, uh, we checked, we assessed the uh, alignment after mechanical around the TKA. So you, uh, with the, this 220 uh, various type of arthritis. And we divided it into four uh, groups, uh, various group, uh, neutral groups, mild various groups, and severe various uh, groups. Uh, so in mechanical around the TKA, uh, neutral and Mild various alignment uh, was found to uh, show superior functional uh, score uh, to various and severe various alignment. <coughs> so uh, the point here is uh, mild various alignment after mechanical alignment TKA may be allowed in terms of clinical outcomes. So uh, we studied the uh, kinematic alignment TKA uh, from 2015. Uh, using this uh, navigation system, uh, and but also uh, we uh, modify the technique uh, to be uh, the tibial uh, bone tib tibial bone cut. So all cases is all three degrees uh, bearers uh, alignment uh, in all cases. So at the uh, series of the study, uh, at first uh, we assessed the radiological and clinical evaluation of uh, chemical and versus mechanical and TKA. So the result indicated that in kinematic around TKA, joint line was parallel to the floor during gait. Uh, calcaneus related ground reaction point uh, making so uh, mechanical axis uh, passed through the center of the knee joint. And the beta flexion angle and function score were found uh, compared with mechanical around TKA. The next uh, study, so we aimed to uh, compare intraoperative kinematics and the soft tissue balance of patients with uh, kinematic and mechanical and TKA. <coughs> so patient uh, inclusion criteria was a primary TKA for various type of osteoarthritis. But also we excluded the uh, severe tibial femoral and uh, patrofemoral osteoarthritis. So we uh, included three kinematically about uh, 30 mechanical and TKA in this study. The process was only uh, limited to the uh, a scrap emotion, which is single light radius uh, mobile bearing processes. So interoperatively, we, we assessed the uh, soft tissue balance using originally developed office uh, type tensor. Uh, with this tensor, we can assess uh, intraoperative soft tissue balance with a femoral component placement and tibial, uh, uh, tibial fem uh, femoral tibial uh, joint reduction like this. So this condition is more relevant to the joint condition after TKA. So using this tensor, we can get the parameters various uh, Vargas ligament balance and the joint center component gap under the uh, 40 pounds of destruction force. As well, we can uh, get the data, kinematic data, using uh, assessed clinical outcomes, including range of motion and new knee society score. 
this is the uh, result of the soft tissue balance. Uh, as you can see, joint <laughs> component gap uh, shown in longitudinal axis showed no significant differences between the two groups. However, while ligament balance uh, shown in the longitudinal axis showed uh, restored uh, value, uh, especially during flexion in kinematic around TKA compared with mechanical around TKA. This is the uh, tibial internal rotation. As you can see, the amount of tibial internal rotation uh, showed a uh, restored uh, value in kinetic and TKA uh, compared with mechanical and TKA. However, no differences were found uh, in tibial uh, internal ro ro uh, translation uh, between the two groups. This is uh, a result of the improvements of the clinical outcomes. So kinetic and TKA showed better result in flexion angle uh, object indicator, patient satisfaction, and functional activity score and, uh, compared with mechanical and TKA. So uh, in conclusion, in clinical and TKA compared with mechanical and TKA, uh, intraoperative assessment is exhibited that mechanical uh, lateral, lateral laxity and tibial internal rotation during correction are uh, restored. Uh, clinical outcomes uh, showed significantly higher patient sat satisfaction as well as flexion angle and the uh, functional score. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity of this presentation. Uh, actually, I am a spine surgeon, but also managing the bone bank in our institute. So let me talk about that. So I'm from Kitasato University. Our university has 1,300 beds, and uh, we perform 1,800 orthopedic surgery. And one of uh, the characteristics in our university is bone bank. I have the biggest, we have biggest bone bank in Japan. So, uh, the main target of our hospital is spinal deformity. We perform about uh, 350 spine surgeries every year, performed by eight spine surgeons. Our university is around here. It is. 20 miles away from Tokyo or Yokohama, and we are managing biggest regional bone banks, uh, dealing allograft bone from both of living and deceased donors. <coughs> this is our <coughs> bone bank, pretty small space, compared with a big production company in the United States, and we use these. Oh, sorry, these. Arograft for spine, uh, not only spine surgery, but uh, such kind of uh, surgery with extensive bone graft and also long fusion surgery spine. Uh, now we have three options for bone grafting. One is autograft, and uh, the other is artificial bone graft, and arograft. But arograft is still minor in Japan. Why minor? Is it because of problem of organizational structure? or a difference of views of life and death. I think both of them exist. This, is, uh, this figure shows a result from report from JOA in 2016, and the blue line is showing the ratio of allograft, uh, quite consistent throughout these five years. And uh, the number of cases using allograft is constantly about 3.5%, <coughs> very small. Let me compare the number of bone banks. In Japan, three bone banks were accredited by Japanese Society of Tissue Transplantation. On the other hand, in US, over 90 bone or musculoskeletal tissue banks were accredited by American Association of Tissue Banks. So supply of allograft is very, very limited in Japan. Uh, from the point of donors, uh, the difference is more radical in Japan we have about 100 donors every year. 
On the other hand, in the United States, 15,000, huge difference, about over 100 times. Uh, we don't have enough donors, and uh, it is a social problem of our country. One more reason, uh, and cell transplantation, we have several kinds of cell transplantation law. But for tissue transplantation, no law was enacted. So we have to manage uh, all of our uh, systems by ourselves. What Regional Bone Bank doing is inform the consent for donor's family, dissection at the hospital where the decreased do deceased donor is encrossed, harvesting allograft bone from the donor, and bringing back the allograft to our university hospital bone bank, processing, packing, freezing of allograft, and delivering the allograft to anywhere it is necessary. So regional bone bank is doing, uh, must do, everything throughout from selection of the donors to shipping to the allograft, shipping the allograft bone. And in Japan, it is not cost effective now. So in total, managing regional bone bank in Japan is very hard to continue. And uh, this figure is showing the proportion of our surgery using allograft, and then the recent trend changing. Spine surgery increase, and over half is spine case. The reason why spine cases increase is uh, lateral interbody fusion surgery. Uh, this is a, a new method of uh, minimum spinal fusion, and we perform oblique lumbar interbody fusion for spondylolisthesis and adult spinal deformity. This is a picture uh, I performed 10 years ago. Oh, he, he was performed a lift, anterior lumbar interbody fusion. At that time, uh, we had a long incision, and uh, we have additional incision to harvest iliac crest. And sometimes patients claim the donor site pain, but using allograft, it never happens. Uh, let me introduce the preliminary data of fusion rate of ORI. Uh, we investigated 34 cases with uh, total 81 levels, and uh, age, with me, age 71 years old, and uh, mainly adult spinal deformity cases. As a result, uh, the fusion rate evaluated by CT one year after surgery is 84% in levels and 73.5% in cases. Uh, we uh, divided patients into two groups, with or without fusion, and age, sex, BMD, number of ORIF levels, number of posterior fusion levels, and the PTH treatment after surgery. Uh, we compared these factors, but, but no uh, factors showed a significant difference between two groups. Uh, in recent evidence is showing PTH uh, has a positive effect for fusion, but in this series, uh, we cannot uh, confirm the effectiveness of PTH. Uh, one more reason why uh, spine cases with allograft increase is long fusion surgery. Now, in Japan, we have a, a super age society, so we have many long fusion cases like this. We also uh, investigate the fusion rate in posterior. Uh, all cases are ESD, and the number of cases are 32. And the surgical method is posterior fusion in two cases, and all in 15 cases, and several kind of osteotomy. And in this uh, study, CT was evaluated at one year after surgery, and one more time later, at the time of uh, at the timing of 2.2 years after surgery. And allograft granule was transplanted, like this. Uh, we evaluated the axial section of the most upper lamina within the fusion level and classified the CT findings into three groups. In group A, uh, continuity was obtained between allograft and the lamina. And in group B, uh, without continuity between these two. And in group C, allograft was dissolved. Uh, it is just a relationship uh, of uh, lamina uh, and uh, allograft. It is very hard to evaluate fusion, so uh, it, uh, I confirmed just a uh, relationship of CT findings. And also post-operative PTH uses uh, continued minimally uh, six months was also investigated. And this is result, and one year uh, after surgery, uh, less than half, 46.9% uh, achieved in comparison. And uh, 21 point in 21.9% cases, uh, allograft was resolved. And at the timing of final follow-up with 2.2 uh, years, a little bit increased, but still low percentage, 56.3% achieved an incorporation. 
and uh, resorption rate was increased. So even after one year, uh, allograft, can, allograft can be resolved. And this table showing the treatment for osteoporosis at the final follow-up. And in group A, most of patient is likely treated by telepartite. And uh, in group C, relatively low percentage, uh, uh, high percentage or without any treatment for osteoporosis. Uh, as Dr. Kaito mentioned, uh, maybe combination of BMP2 and uh, telepartite effective, but uh, actually we cannot use the BMP2 because it's not approved in Japan. So now I think PTH might be one option which may increase the allograft fusion rate. And also uh, additional invention should be necessary in the future study. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, risk factors for uh, postoperative deep infection in bone tumors. Postoperative deep infection after bone tumor surgery remains a serious complication. Uh, there are numerous uh, reports about risk factors for postoperative deep infection in general surgery. However, there is only a small number of reports about risk factors for bone tumor surgery. Uh, this is <coughs> Uh, case of osteosarcoma of left pelvis. After pre uh, preoperative uh, chemotherapy, tumor excision was performed. During the surgery, the rejected bone was frozen by liquid nitrogen. After the freezing, the uh, tumor bearing frozen bone was used for reconstruction. Uh, this is the postoperative uh, x ray. Uh, after the surgery, he had a uh, deep infection. Uh, several factors, including location, uh, tumor location, chemotherapy, operative time, uh, and procedures may influence postoperative deep infection. The purpose of this study was to investigate the risk factors for postoperative deep infection and to determine the pre uh, uh, post deep, deep infection. This retrospect st study included 681 patients with 80, 844 bone tumors who underwent surgery. Uh, the table shows the uh, histological diagnosis of the study. Uh, uh, this study included benign tumors and malignant Tumors. Uh, the incidence of postoperative deep infection and its association with various factors were evaluated. Uh, the uh, patient related parameters included age, tumor location, recurrent tumor, pathological fracture, and chemotherapy. And surgery related parameters included the use of an implant, biological reconstruction, artificial bone or bone cement, additional surgery for complications, operative time, and intraoperative blood loss. Uh, then, multivariate analysis uh, included parameters with uh, statistical significance, significance in univariate analysis. <coughs> Uh, this is the instance of postoperative deep infection uh, in each location. Uh, pelvic tumor has a high incidence of uh, postoperative deep infection. Uh, this is a univariate analysis of patient related characteristics uh, tumor locations, and uh, chemotherapy uh, was uh, uh, associated with. Uh, increased risk of deep infection. Uh, this is a univariate analysis of surgery-related characteristics. All of the use of implant, uh, biological reconstruction, 
uh, artificial bone or bone cement, additional surgery, operative, operative time, and intraoperative blood loss were associated with the uh, in, uh, risk of uh, deep infection. This is multivariate analysis. Uh, this uh, analysis included uh, pelvic tumor operative time, use of an implant, biological reconstruction, chemotherapy, uh, uh, additional surgery, artificial bone or bone cement, and uh, intraoperative blood loss. In this analysis, uh, pelvic tumor and use of an implant were uh, associated with uh, increased risk of uh, deep infection. Uh, biological rec reconstruction had uh, marginal uh, significance uh, uh, of the deep infection. Uh, risk factors for uh, uh, infection after general surgery was uh, ah, sorry, uh, uh, this uh, in the previous report. Uh, operative time uh, was uh, associated with uh, risk, uh, risk increased risk of deep infection. Another uh, study showed that pelvic tumor had high incidence of postoperative deep infection. Uh, uh, so, uh, tumor surgery with without implant had low risk of in, uh, deep infection. On the other hand, uh, the case with tumor prosthesis allograft or frozen autograft had high risk of uh, deep infection. Uh, in conclusion, this retrospect study showed that pelvic tumor and use of an implant were independent risk factors for deep infection. Uh, deep, this uh, information will help surgeons, prepare, uh, surgeons <coughs> to prepare an adequate surgical plan for patients with bone tumors. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hiroaki Nakashima, I'm a spine surgeon. Thank you very much for hosting us in this fellowship. I'm very honored to present my research at this time. Today, I'm going to talk about lateral access surgery, especially about what can we do from lateral in spinal surgery. Lateral lumbar interbody fusion is a relatively new technique with less invasiveness. There are two types of approach. One is X-lift through lateral approach. Another is O-lift oblique approach. The advantage of this surgery is less invasiveness. By restoration of this height and alignment, we can indirectly decompress spinal canal. In addition, we can achieve reduction of spinal deformity. However, the advantage of this surgery is radiation exposure for doctors during surgery. We need to use fluoroscopy in this surgery. Then cancer or other diseases might, be, might become. Then we developed simultaneous lumbar inner body fusion and percutaneous pedicle screw as shown in this slide. As you can see here, there are need uh, two types of uh, surgeon, front surgeon and back surgeon. Back surgeon now, uh, front surgeon now inserting the cage and the back surgeon inserting the pedicle screw simultaneously in our hospital. By using this technique, operative time was reduced in 20 minutes and occupation time of OR reduced in 80 minutes. <coughs> This is a case representative of two-level interbody fusion. As you can see here, the scoliosis 
and the lumbar degenerative changes were well corrected by this surgery. Operative time was 75 minutes and blood loss was 74 minutes. In addition, spinal canal was indirectly decompressed, as shown in this slide. In terms of other spinal deformity, we usually use two-stage surgery. First stage is multiple LIF, and second stage is posterior correction with L5S P lift or T lift. This is a case of 76, 67 female with low back pain, lower extremity pain, and with other diseases. We first planned LIF from L12 to L45. As you can see here, scoliosis was a little bit corrected by this LIF. And we performed second posterior surgery from T10 to pelvis with L5S PD. Operative time was in total six hours and the blood loss was 1,000 milliliter. This is a pre and post-operative radiograph. As you can see here, scoliosis and kyphosis are well corrected by this surgery. The summary of the operative result, blood loss and blood transfusion was well reduced in this LIF surgery. In addition, ICU administration and complication rate was significantly reduced by this technique. Limited osteotomy is needed in this LIF technique, then blood loss is significantly less. In addition to interbody fusion technique, we use this lateral colpectomy for vertebral deformity case. This is a case of L1 fracture. After very small seven centimeter skin incision, we performed vertebrectomy and we inserted vertebral cages. Operative time was 110 minutes and EBL was 100 milliliter. Although this previous case is very simple and easy case for spine surgeon, however, visit kyphosis after vertebral fracture is still challenging in such alignment correction. Usually, osteotomy like PSO was necessary. Then surgical invasiveness is very high. Then we developed lateral colpectomy and reconstruction with ALL release. After ALL release, we put the cages. Then we can achieve larger collection by using this technique. This, tech, uh, this is a representative of 65 years old female with rigid kyphosis. As you can see here, kyphosis was around 50 degrees and very rigid in flexion and extension X-ray. We performed the T12 colpectomy and AL release, in addition posterior uh, osteotomy and posterior percutaneous pedicle skill fixation. Operative time in total was 309 minutes, 95 minutes, and EBL was 315 milliliter. This is a pre and posterior radiograph. As you can see here, local kyphosis was very corrected. This is a summary of correction of sagittal alignment. By using lumbar interbody infusion technique from lateral, we can achieve enough correction as shown in this posterior surgery. In addition, by cutting the ALL, larger correction can be achieved with less <coughs> invasiveness. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Taku Hatta. Uh, the, it's my great honor to present my studies uh, and visit uh, University of Washington, uh, Ichiro, Marina City. You're yeah, very great. The, I would like to talk about the uh, treatment of the rotator cuff tears. 
Therefore, the treatment of rotator cuff tear, surgical options are highly individualized, including rotator cuff repair, augmentation with patch graft or tendon transfer, or prosthesis. The rotator cuff repair sometimes causes retear after surgery, and this may result in cuff dysfunction. On the other hand, the biggest problem of the prosthesis is the complication, especially after reversal arthroplasty, that there are limited salvage options after failure. This is, this is a study regarding the prevalence of the rotator cuff tear in Japan. According to these data, that we can assume approximately 10% population in Japan has a rotator cuff tear. It's very surprising. This is our study regarding the mechanism of cuff tear enlargement using finite element analysis. We obtained the CD data from cadaveric shoulder, created tear model, and applied loading with 22 Newton. And we, we found the exponentially increased the stiff con uh, stress concentration as advanced rotator cuff tear. So we can prove the zipper phenomenon the, for the uh, cuff tear enlargement. In addition to arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, we frequently use the superior capsule reconstruction. This technique is, has been uh, developed by the Dr. Teruhisa Mihata from Japan and spread it by American doctors. The biggest difference uh, between America and Japan is the graft tendon. So in America, American doctors always use a dermal uh, allograft. On the other hand, so uh, the, in Japan, the most surgeons use the old graft from fascia lata. This is a picture of, this, of my surgery. The, we harvest the fascia lata and two or three fold, and the, we believe the most important part is the thickness of the graft tendon. And the, using the arthroscope, so we insert the graft into the joint. The 67-year-old female uh, underwent uh, uh, the spiral capsule reconstruction for massive rotator cuff tear. And after two years follow-up, the reconstruction is very good and the center of the rotation maintained. Clinically, the range of motion is good and she looks happy. 82-year-old female also underwent the superior capsule reconstruction for massive rotator cuff tear. And uh, after two years follow-up, the reconstruction is good and center of the rotation maintained, and the range of motion restored. Reverse shoulder arthroplasty is also a good, very good option uh, in Japan. Fortunately, we could use reverse uh, from 2014, but uh, we felt some difficulty, especially for the uh, patient with small skeletal structures, such as uh, elder female. And uh, we uh, frequently use a combined use of the trabecular metal reverse and comprehensive. This combination looks very good. So now we have ongoing study regarding the functional recovery, especially for superior capsule reconstruction and reverse shoulder arthroplasty. We assess the uh, muscle, uh, muscle activity using the positron emission, em, uh, positron emission tomography. Uh, especially for deltoid muscle, trapezius muscle, and surface certus anterior muscle, and so on. So in the near future, uh, we can show you the results. Today, I'd like to have uh, the small talk regarding the biomechanical effect of arthroscopic rotator cuff repair techniques on rotator cuff muscle. You know, various techniques have been introduced, such as uh, single row, double row, and transosseous equivalent, uh, equivalent technique with medial row suture or not. In addition, a lot of biomechanical studies have been reported, but most studies focus on the repair site properties, such as failure strength, contact pressure, or water tightness after repair. Uh, recent studies also uh, the re uh, reported the muscular tenderness junction as an inferior mechanical properties after some repair. On the other hand, there have been few studies focused on the muscle properties. Shear wave elastography is recently focused as a qualitative assessment tool for soft tissue elasticity. They have been reported to use for thyroid tumor, breast cancer, or liver fibrosis. And there are some trials to assess mus uh, muscular ten uh, skeletal tissues to assess passive stiffness of the skeletal muscle. So we focus on this technique to assess mechanical properties of the rotator cuff muscle after repair. We firstly uh, assess the anatomical features of the supraspinatus muscle for the shear wave elastography. 
that we could divide it into four mass regions, anterior superficial, posterior superficial, anterior deep, and posterior deep. So uh, we can measure four, uh, four mass regions by placing the ultrasound probe parallel to each muscle fiber orientation. And we also found uh, uh, this segmental measurement showed the excellent reliability. So the purposes of their studies to assess uh, passive stiffness changes in the supraspinatus muscle after various techniques for the rotator cuff repair. We used the 12 fresh frozen cadavers with rotator cuff tears. This includes six small tear and six medium to large tear. And to assess the double technique and uh, not less transosseous equivalent technique. We also used the eight fresh frozen cadavers and created 30 by 40 millimeter defect to assess the margin convergence technique. All repaired and, uh, techniques underwent a 30 degree abduction. For the study one, so the <clears throat> we placed the medial row anchors and uh, passed the suture through the tendon, and we performed the rotator cuff repair uh, using the double row technique or a not less trans-osseous equivalent technique in a random order. Uh, for the study two, uh, we created the, uh, the rotator cuff defect to assess the margin convergence technique, and the one suture, two suture, or three sutures <coughs> for the margin convergence technique, and we also performed the single row repair. And for the uh, SW assessment, we measure the uh, four muscle region at zero to 90 degree abduction. And we also assess the increased muscle stiffness after repair uh, by comparing between pre and post operative values. This is a result for study one. Uh, this table, uh, this figure show the increased stiffness changes after uh, uh, increased stiffness after not less TOE or double row technique. The in small tears, we found uh, one around one th about one thirty percent increase after both repair, and there are no significant changes. On the other hand, in the medium to large tear group. The uh, approximately 200% increase after no rest TOE. On the other hand, 187 to over 30, 300% increase after double row repair, and there are significant differences. And uh, for the study two, the, this figure showed the increased stiffness with margin convergence technique. So we found the decreased uh, stiffness changes uh, with increased number of uh, sutures for margin convergence technique. So we can assume these mechanical properties as uh, spring structures. So if it is uniform stiffness changes after repair, uh, such as a not STOE technique, so we can uh, we can say this is an appropriate mechanical environment and this may generate adequate force. On the other hand, if it is imbalanced or excessive, so the <clears throat> This may result in the, uh, some symptoms, so the uh, pain or uh, muscle cramp, uh, cuff dysfunction, or retear after surgery. Of course, there are several limitations, including in vitro studies and small number of specimens. But for the future perspective, the keyword for, for me is a uniform and less excessive technique to identify the optimal technique for the rotator cuff muscle properties. So far, we can say the not less TOE technique may be better for the medium tear or more. And uh, we also say the, uh, the margin convergence technique may be effective for U-shaped tear. At last, uh, the, for the treatment strategy, uh, the arthroscopic rotator cuff repair as the first choice, and the superior capsule reconstruction for large tear with fatty degeneration, and river showed up arthroplasty for cases over 70 years old. I'm showing the acknowledgement and thank you for your attention.
you speak up a little bit? Uh, so far, no. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, this is also interesting part because uh, the you know the superior capsule for the superior capsule reconstruction, we never touch the suprasmian muscle, just the glenoid and the humeral and the contact. And but there are some studies said uh, some muscle strengths that improve after surgery. That's why that I'm also interested. What happened to this muscle? Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, sir. I have a question for the first speaker regarding uh, the compliance issues. You mentioned the use of paraparasites. Are there existing additional PTH analogs that could be utilized for these purposes as well as additional developments? Uh, no, I use uh, uh, teleparasite, the PTH 134, which is uh, commercially uh, available in Japan. So, not developed in the new one. So. I, I didn't explain about the working mechanism, but uh, if you use a BMT, it uh, uh, activated the bone formation process, but also activated the source gene. The transcript of the source gene is sclerosis, you know. So it is antagonist of the wind signaling. So by using teleparatide, it blocked the working of the sclerosis on the wind receptor. So it activates the wind signaling. So it can, so then it led to the synergistic effect of the use of BMP and Telparatite. There are newer PTH analogs that are being studied right now, which are suggesting that this is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is going to be a total debug. So there, there is some evidence in studies in the United States that have been uh, applying to that very degree of anatomic errors. Just, you know, there's a big debate whether that comes from premature muscle or premature brain disorder. But I wonder see that in the future, relatively well, speaking, because we're operating on so many more uh, obese patients, or patients that in general are in very, very premature brain disease. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, in Japan, just uh, fortunately, so no <laughs> obesity, uh, almost no <laughs> obesity patients. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so last question. Uh, uh, so uh, as you know, so if you are uh, alignment, about the three degrees, uh, both parties very so so dangerous, dangerous. Uh, but 
process of using by using the Nabil ecosystem so to reduce uh, affiliate suits to the top uh, can, can be obtained. So that's why so also we're gonna do uh, this approach. And so maybe this uh, technique uh, can so go forward so for the Uh, thank you. So, in the report about the, in 2010 or something, in the developing process, uh, in your feature, the DMP heterodyma expressed just a short time. But uh, in the, how to say, after you became mature, uh, it is not uh, exist in human body. you alluded to uh, the preference for the use of autograft um, and over allograft for rotator cuff surgery or for spine surgery um, and when I was in Japan I didn't see any use of allograft. Is this uh, a supply and demand issue or is this a cultural uh, preference by uh, patients and if it is a cultural preference where does this uh, come from and what's the concern? Oh yeah, uh, I think uh, it's a problem of system and the uh, difference of way of thinking. Actually, uh, in commercial days, uh, the mineralized bone matrix was approved in Japan just now, maybe a few months ago. And uh, both of patient and uh, doctors accepted to use it. So I don't know uh, uh, they are recognizing that, that is autograft or not, but basically, uh, translation from the other people, uh, people hesitate to be transplanted in Japan. And is that because of concern for risk of infection? Mm, yes, uh, such kind of scientific reason, and uh, and also you know it's a you know, some kind of regional reason. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to be transplanted. May have to. Sure. Yeah. And uh, for the rotator cuff, uh, the superior capsular reconstruction. So the, we believe the healing property is better uh, if I use the autograft uh, instead of the allograft. That's why the, uh, in terms of the healing process, the autograft is better. And uh, the other part is the uh, uh, inpatient system. So that we can treat for the rotator cuff repair as an inpatient. That's why the, even if I harvest from the fascia lata, I can treat, uh, the, I can select this part as an inpatient. That's a big difference. For that talk, uh, in regards to the infections that are developing in the pelvis, are you seeing more gram negative infections compared to other areas of the body where you're seeing gram positive infections?